47 different species. So we may not have a lot of birds, but we have a lot of species. Other places will give you 200 uh, ibises. Whoopee, you know, but we'll give you a lot of other stuff. So I, my name's Lou Hecker. I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, this area of recreation falls within the public use domain at this refuge. And public use is administered by my boss, Jake Puddle, who is going to give this lecture. And his qualifications for doing this are that he is an outdoorsman par excellence. He's a kayaker, a canoeer, a birder, a hunter, a fisherman. He's a superman of the outdoors. I'm not looking for hmm. a raise. <laughs> it was too long for the business card. <laughs> So I'm going to turn it over to Jake. If you all just silence your phones, we're going to dim the lights, and then after the lecture, we will have a brief question and answer. Now, one last housekeeping note. Next week, we're having the lecture on alligators. By probably the foremost expert in the world on alligators of Florida, Dr. Laura Brand. And she's coming up from Fort Lauderdale to put this lecture on and hopefully she's going to bring some of her critters with her. So you may have a chance to tickle the belly of an alligator next week. So I, and we expect a big turnout. So if you want to be assured of a seat, come early and grab your seats. Okay, Jake, you're up. All right, thanks, Lou. Um, yeah, could you hit the lights, please, Steve? Thanks. Okay, um, Welcome to Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. Um, my name is Jake Tuttle. We're going to be talking about recreational opportunities here and uh, across National Wildlife Refuges. Uh, how many people are the first time either here or to a National Wildlife Refuge? A couple of you. Good, good, good. Um, okay, so you made it. That's, that's step one. Um, so Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge is part of a, a nationwide system of National Wildlife Refuges administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service under the Department of Interior. Um, this, this is a system of public land set aside primarily for America's uh, fish and wildlife species and habitat. Um, the, the system actually began uh, just north of here at Pelican Island in 1903 and now expands over 150 million acres of public land across refuges and wetland management districts. So the mission statement of this, and this is the only thing I'm going to read word for word because I want to get it right, to administer a national network of lands and waters for the conservation, management, and where appropriate restoration of the fish, wildlife, and plant resources and their habitats within the United States for the benefits of present and future generations of Americans. So it's for you. We do this for the public, for wildlife, for everyone to enjoy, and for human health benefits. So this is a map of the National Wildlife Refuge System, and all these blue dots represent a management unit, mostly National Wildlife Refuges across the country. So of course, we are here in Florida, So the National Wildlife Refuge Improvement Act of 1997 basically identified compatible wildlife dependent recreation as an appropriate and legitimate use in a wildlife refuge. Now there was public use prior to that, but this, this made these uh, wildlife dependent recreations um, it, it, it made them compatible and legitimate and as uh, kind of a, a core of what we believe in, what people will have the opportunity to do on National Wildlife Refuges. So it's considered in all planning and management activities a, as a priority use. Um, th from that, we derive the big six, and these are our primary wildlife dependent recreational opportunities on a refuge. Hunting, fishing, wildlife observation, wildlife photography, environmental education, and interpretation. 
Okay, so I'm going to bring you to the refuge. This is a map of Florida, which consists of 28 National Wildlife Refuges. Pelican Island being the first one in 1903. Okay, this is a map of the Arthur R. Marshall Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge. So we are here in the headquarters area. So you can kind of get oriented depending on which area you came from. Um, and this, this is picture, pictures of just some scenes around the refuge. Now, all the pictures in this presentation were taken from the refuge primarily through our photo contest. So you can keep that in mind as we're going through this. Uh, approximately 144,000 acres, 220 square miles of northern Everglades. Okay, so like I said, you made it, you're here, you're in the visitor center. And once you get through the front gate, we encourage people to come to the visitor center to get information um, on the history of, it, you know, the um, natural history of this area, the history of the water flow um, in southern Florida and Ever Everglades in general, and then specific information about this refuge. Um, so some of our more popular attractions in the visitor center are virtual airboat ride. It'll simulate what it looks like on the interior of the refuge on the majority of that 144,000 acres um, without actually getting out there. And it's a, it's a quick, fun trip that you can do here. Um, Night Sounds of the Everglades. It's a, a panoramic um, exhibit that you walk into and it'll go dark and it walks you through um, the sounds of, of wildlife and other things that you'll hear at night in the Everglades. And then a gator hole is a, a replication of a, a slough habitat or a gator hole where you can, it's, it's mainly for, for kids, but you can crawl through it and actually see what's below the surface of the water on most of the refuge. Um, so, and many other exhibits um, for educational purposes. We use this room for meeting areas and we actually um, run a, a video upon request that gives you the history of the refuge. And then you walk by our gift shop. Our gift shop is um, owned and operated by our friends group, which is a nonprofit organization that so directly supports the mission of the refuge. Um, so we will move on. Um, in the visitor center, you can sign up for, for guided bird walks, nature walks, canoe trails. Um, this is all, uh, well, excuse me, primarily run by Volunteer Corps. We do have staff that, that does it, but most of our tours are facilitated by volunteers, and we could not operate without our Volunteer Corps. Um, and then canoes, um, you can certainly bring your own canoe or kayak, but we have canoe rentals um, at the end of Lee Road, which is the main road that you just ent entered. Um, to access our canoe trail. We also have uh, ranger-led tours for schools. This is done through staff and partner environmental education um, facilities that have, that have school field trips here um, really year-round for educational, uh, you know, proper school programs as well as summer camps. And then your, uh, we have a new QR trail, which is associated with our Marsh Trail, and you use your smartphone or cell phone to access a, a self-guided tour. And I have a, a sign right here. You'll see these around the refuge where you can scan the barcode, and it'll give you a two to three minute environmental education um, a message on whatever the topic may be. How do you scan the barcodes? Good question. So you have to, if you have a smartphone, you have to download an app from your app store and it'll be a QR reader, a quick response reader from your, from your app store. And then you'll have the app on your phone and when you engage that, it'll have a screenshot just like you're taking a picture and essentially it'll, when it comes into focus, it'll recognize that barcode and then go through the process. If you have a regular phone, you can call up to get the Audio. That's exactly right. If you do not have a smartphone, there is a telephone number associated with this system that you can call and just get the audio for the for the message that's being presented. So, 
Okay, the uh, the Cypress Swamp Boardwalk. Um, this is the closest trail to the visitor center. It's directly behind the visitor center. It's approximately 0.4 miles of trail. It's a boardwalk going through our Cypress Swamp, and really the only way to get through the swamp. Um, it's uh, you know Cypress knees two feet high. A lot of the year, it's inundated with water, so it's a uh, uh, you know, a nice way to get through habitat that you otherwise would not be able to experience. Um, so we do cypress trees, pine apple trees, ferns, and, and a lot of other um, flora and fauna through there. Uh, some of the species uh, that I have presented here are great horned owl and a pileated woodpecker. Um, you're most likely going to hear this guy, and but you'll see a lot of this guy when you go out. So, so the butterfly garden and marsh trail. In the center of the parking lot, we have a butterfly garden. Also in other areas in close proximity to the building. Um, it's just, it, it's more of a serene area. It does attract a lot of pollinators um, and other invertebrates that you can, you know, just enjoy and look for in those areas. Uh, and then the Marsh Trail, which is across Lee Road, it's a series of impoundments, basically levied cells of water uh, with uh, that are approximately eight tenths of a mile a piece um, that are open for hiking and biking, and I'll show you maps of all this as we go through the presentation. Okay, um, the this is what we call the sea impoundments, and the marsh trail is around C7, but all of this is open for public use, for hiking and biking, uh, wildlife photography, viewing, etc. There's an observation tower on this uh, southwest side of C7, and there's resting areas along the way, including a photo blind that comes out into C8. Um, excuse me, is that where the photo blind? Yeah, photo blind. Um, so you can kind of get a little closer to the habitat and wildlife that are in that area. We are here now, so if you were to go here, there from here, you could you go out the parking lot, Ooh. Um, go down this road and park here, and then you can access the trails, or you can just simply walk the same route. There's also a marsh trail here, which goes north into our A impoundments, and these are newly opened impoundments. I do not have um, a real good map for this presentation, but it's it's all the impoundments north of Lee Road, our, our main road coming in, that are also open for hiking and biking and fishing. So our, our canoe trail, it's 5.5 miles. It's an excellent way to get close to nature. You'll see a lot of alligators, a lot of fish, <laughs> a lot of birds, and a lot of um, aquatic vegetation that you will not see anywhere else on the refuge. Um, so the map of the canoe trail, If here's, here's Lee Road and we have a series of boat ramps here. When you go to the end of the road, you'll see um, a kiosk for canoe rentals and a rack of canoes and the 5.5 miles does this loop right here into the interior of the refuge. So this is, this is what it looks like on our waterfront at the, at the boat ramp um, and these are the canoes that are available for rent. So biking trails, we have a lot of new biking trails um, added just two months ago um, to the refuge. So the, the green lines here are the new trails. The red line here is existing trails. However, the red line currently is closed due to ongoing construction projects. But the added trails along this L40 and L39 levee are an additional 27 miles of trail. This, these trails within the A impoundments north of Lee Road are an additional five miles of trail. And then the C impoundments where the hiking trails are, are also now open for biking and that's an additional uh, approximately three miles of trail. So altogether, including the area that is uh, temporarily closed, it's just over 50 miles of, of biking trails with the goal eventually opening the entire perimeter of the refuge uh, for biking. 
So hunting and fishing. We develop and we develop and conduct a quality and biologically sound program, and these are the goals of our program: to lead, lead enjoyable recreation experiences, uh, to create a greater understanding and appreciation of wildlife resources, and aid in the conservation of wildlife populations in their habitats. So our hunting and fishing program. Um, Fish, fish of all species may be taken. Hunting of alligator on a limited basis. We allow 11 permits per year and we limit the season. Uh, we, res we restrict our season compared to the state season to two weekends in September and two weekends. So it's two weekends in September and two weekends in October, I believe. It's the first two weekends of the open season for the state and it changes every year based on the state season. And then duck hunting, duck hunting is open also um, with the state season. So we have an early teal season in September and then the two seasons during regular waterfowl season which are typically the week of Thanksgiving and then starting this weekend until the end of January. So the areas that are open to hunting and fishing our primary hunting area is the lower portion of the refuge. It's approximately 30,000 acres. This is the higher water level, so you get more waterfowl um, wading and feeding in this area. Uh, you access this area from Loxahatchee Road. Again, we are here at the headquarters. Loxahatchee Road is 12 miles, miles south on 441. And if you go six miles down Loxahatchee, that's the entrance area to the, uh, the parking lot and boat ramp. And then you can access all with boat. The other areas open for the consumptive uses, which are hunting and fishing, are the perimeter canal around the refuge. So this perimeter canal is open only to fishing. You cannot hunt north of this demarcation line here. So that makes uh, two-thirds of the refuge closed to the public, and that area is primarily set aside for fish and wildlife habitat and also our um, exotic species uh, vegetation control program and water quality testing. So, all right, um, that, those are our big six um, uh, recreational uses or wildlife dependent recreation. Um, this self-guided tour for, for some of you who are interested, I have videos that I'd, I'd like to show. I'd like to take some questions um, as well. But I'd like to show a few of those videos just to give you an idea of what you'll see on that QR trail, quick response. Um, and maybe I'll encourage you to get out there and find the rest of them. They're, they're, I'm really proud of those videos. We came together with our friends group and staff and, and produce those videos and they're uh, of really high quality. Um, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to switch gears to I'll show one just to give you an idea and then I'll take questions. These are large black butterflies with different patterns of yellow and white markings. 
Ruddy dagger wings, with their burnt orange color, are a favorite for visitors as they stroll along our cypress swamp boardwalk. In the shady parts of the refuge, you are almost sure to see our state butterfly, the zebra longwing. Its long wings are marked with a yellow and black pattern, and it has a very slow, fluttering flight. It is found all year because, unlike most other butterflies, it lives for many months. This is because it eats pollen in addition to nectar. The pollen has fats and proteins, but nectar only contains sugars that do not make a complete diet. Two of the adaptations that aid in animal survival are camouflage and mimicry. Many animals on the refuge, including insects such as grasshoppers, use camouflage to help them blend into their habitats. This allows them to consume food without being seen and thereby prevents them from becoming food for another animal. Mimicry is another form of adaptation where one animal tries to copy the behavior or look of a more poisonous animal to scare off a predator. Some butterflies are particularly adept at mimicry. Monarchs, queens, and soldiers are known as the milkweed butterflies because they all feed on the milkweed plant. Milkweed contains a poisonous sap that makes these butterflies unpalatable. At one taste, birds learn to avoid them. The viceroy, with its orange color and distinctive black markings, mimics these three milkweed butterflies, but it does not feed on milkweed. However, it is equally unpleasant to the taste, with its caterpillars feeding on the willow tree, the source of the acid that goes into aspirin. Each of these butterflies is provided extra protection as a result of mimicking one another. Butterflies and their insect relatives are very fascinating animals. Here at the refuge, they are easily observed and especially abundant. Enjoy observing these animals throughout the refuge in all of their different colors, shapes, and sizes. All right, so you can find these type videos all around the refuge through this QR system. Um, and it's just a really unique way to learn a little bit more about a particular subject that you may not have known. And, and at the same time, while you're out on the trail, you don't have to be in four walls to, to hear this information. Is there a URL that if you don't have a smartphone, you can access these videos? Too? The video, there is, but I do not have that right now. Um, Jay Peretti's would, would know off the bat, but I do not have that. So we can, we can flip. Okay. Lou, can you hit the lights, please? Um, did you hear Eleanor? She, it's on the Friends website. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Is there like a, a boardwalk or a promenade that you take the hike or walking on? I mean, is there something that protects you from alligators? Okay. For That's a good question. I'm open to ocean yeah. All right. So, the the Cypress Swamp Boardwalk. I'm trying to think. I don't want to tell you wrong. It's pretty much the only hiking trail that's actually on a boardwalk. Everything else is dirt or gravel roads on top of the levees. So I would not recommend open toe shoes. But I, I wouldn't have fear of, of animals out here. Um, you will see alligators. Uh, you may see snakes and raccoons. But I tell everybody, it, if you respect them, they'll respect you. So... If, if you give them their, sp their space, they'll just stay right there. They don't, they don't want you. You're not part of their natural food chain or anything like that. And <laughs> they're more scared of you than you are of them. I'm sorry? Are there incidents? Well, not today, so. We're doing pretty good this month. Um, Closed toes, shoes, the, and socks are good for so, fire ants, too, which are not right. staying away from you. So that's probably the, the most frequent incident is, is insects. Um, I don't know of any snake incidences, and the, of the two alligator incidences that I know of, people were either, in, it basically got too close to an animal, and that animal basically defended theirself. So as, as you know, logical people, we can walk around, you know you don't, paddle up to an alligator intentionally and try to provoke it, or you don't step on an alligator's head, which happened in the other incident. That was an accident, but it did happen. So the, the likelihood of you if something happening to you on the trails is, is slim to none. So it's a, it's a safe place, believe me. Bruce. When you plant open up this guy's little marsh, 
Okay, good question. Um, we do not own Strazula Marsh yet. From the original plans, we will be acquiring Strazula Marsh in March 2016. Those plans are subject to change. However, the, from the day we acquire that land or the land swap takes place, it'll be approximately one year before we have a plan in place. So we're looking three to five years out from that, I would say, to actually have, um, you know, implement that plan on the ground. Yes, ma'am. I have a question on canoes. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have a procedure where people have to wash the bottoms of their canoes? I know back in Massachusetts, we worry about invasive species like milfoil and milfoil and things like that, and anyone who goes from one lake to another has to scrub down their canoe. Uh, we do not have a process like that. No, ma'am. Is there any problem with invasive species coming in here? There are, there are issues with ex invasive species, but the invasive species that, that are of higher priority are not, being, are not coming in by canoe. They are, they're not water dispersed, they're air dispersed species. What are, the, what are some of the ones, air dispersed? Um, the uh, Ligodium, which is a, a climbing fern, um, and well, Melaleuca is water dispersed, but it's not coming in by canoes. It's coming in from the basically the system of water that flows through the Everglades and, and those seeds are within that system. Um, so those are, our, those are two main exotics that we spend most of our time on in the interior. So, yes ma'am. Any other questions? Any, all right. Anybody inspired? <laughs> good, good. Sure, I'll show as many as you like. Would you like to see some more videos or QR? Sure.